18 meters dam breaks in Liaoning, people flee at night. Severe floods, victims starve to death, CCP leaders suspected of hiding on vacation, public opinion in many places condemns. Local governments of the Communist Party of China have issued 4.2 trillion yuan in bonds in seven months, with nearly half of it used solely to pay off debt. Since June, many places in mainland China have suffered from heavy rains and sweeping floods, causing serious damage. Many cities in northeastern and southern China were submerged and many villages were swept away and damaged. The impact on human life, crops and property has been enormous and dam breaches have occurred continuously. Recently, the water level of the Wang River a tributary of the Liaohe River in Tiling, Liaoning Province, has continued to rise. The Wang River embankment in Fangia Village, Shuangjingzi Town, Tiling County, breached at about 4 m on August 6 with a width of about 18 meters, and hundreds of households and two villages in the area had to be urgently evacuated. Xinhua News Agency reported that the relevant departments of Tiling City, Liaoning Province, stated on August 6 that since the start of the main flood season, continuous heavy rainfall has caused the total rainfall to reach 2.4 times that of previous years, and the water level of the Wang River has continued to rise. At about 4.40 a.m. on August 6, patrol personnel discovered a breach in the Fangia village section on the right bank of the Wang River in Tiling County, Tiling City, Liaoning Province. The width of the breach was about 18 meters. A total of 190 households and 395 people have been relocated locally. Affected by the breach, about 1,500 acres of farmland in the surrounding area were flooded. After the Wang River embankment in Fangia village broke, the river water flowed back into the farmland. The water level inside and outside the embankment remained high, with a maximum depth measured at 5.2 meters, causing some farmland to be flooded. Currently, the Rescue Command Center reports that more than 700 residents have been evacuated and no casualties have been reported. There are 40 trucks working continuously on site to transport stones to block the breach. Many mainland netizens mocked in the doing comment section, saying, it's the same height inside and outside. Is it that difficult? And the water is flat. Is it meaningful? One frustrated citizen remarked, the government always creates very good propaganda images to help people in flood areas. But why do many areas affected by flash floods have no food to eat? Many people have been reported starving because there is no food. Many villages were swept away. Have you, authorities and rescuers, brought food and necessities to help the people? Let's do practical things, stop spreading nonsense. According to the Liaoning official website on the 7th, the Liaoning Provincial Meteorological Bureau stated that in July this year, the average precipitation in the province was 2.1 times the annual average the highest in the same period since 1951. There were 10 rounds of heavy precipitation in the province, including four regional rainstorms. According to statistics, the average precipitation in the province in July reached 337.7 millimeters, 70% more than the same period last year. Since June this year, many incidents of dam breaches have been reported by mainland media. At about 8 o'clock on July 28, the Sixin Dyke in Zinting Village, Guojiaqiao, Yasu Town, Shangtan County, Shangtan City, Hunan Province, was in danger of a dam breach. By 3.58 a.m. on the 29th, the breach had expanded to 77 meters. At least 3,832 people were urgently evacuated. On the same day, another breach occurred in Jenshui, a first-level tributary of the Shangjiang River. A dike in Jenshui near Longton Village, Washi Town, Shangtan County broke, and local residents were urgently evacuated. On July 5, the dike on the Dongting Lake Line in Tuanshaowan, Warong County, Yuying City, Hunan Province, broke due to continuous heavy rainfall. 
The longest width was about 226 meters, causing several villages to be flooded and more than 47 square kilometers to be inundated. Officials stated that 5,755 people were urgently evacuated locally and no casualties were reported. This statement was widely questioned by the public. According to Radio France International, the authorities asked no one to speak to the media to avoid public criticism. Severe floods, victims starved to death, CCP leaders suspected of hiding on vacation, public opinion in many places condemns. China is flooding, disasters are severe in various places, and while people are waiting for rescue, CCP top leaders are suspected of having taken a collective vacation in Baidehi, causing condemnation. Starting from Tuesday, August 6, Shanxi and Gansu have suffered floods again. People in the disaster area reported, the water in Hudegu is too big, you see the front bumper of the car on the opposite side is almost washed away. On August 7, the water level of the Malian River in Qingyang City, Gansu Province surged, and the floods inundated the mountain city and rolled out of residents' houses. The streets in the city turned into an ocean, and many cars were flooded. Mr. Wang, a resident of one county, Qingyang City, Gansu Province, said, It rose so high that this bridge was almost flooded. The water went over the bridge head and flooded over, and there was a disaster. Recently, the disaster in the three northeastern provinces, Sichuan and Hunan, has been particularly serious due to the continuous discharge of floodwaters from reservoirs, resulting in floods. At least hundreds of people in Hunan and Sichuan were killed or lost contact. Citizens of Zixing City, Hunan province disclosed that due to the flood discharge of the reservoir, dozens of local villages were flooded. Due to the lack of timely rescue, many of the survivors starved to death. Mr. Chen, a disaster victim in Zixing, said, The missing people are still being searched for, and the situation is not good. Today, a family of six was found, but it is gone. Everything was washed away, there was no food, and too many people starved to death. A friend's aunt was washed away by the water, and his uncle starved to death. An old man in Longxi starved to death after starving for a few days. His own children could not walk in, and they were gone when he rushed over. It was too tragic and cannot be described. Faced with such a devastating disaster, where are the top CCP officials? Xinhua News Agency reported on August 4 that Kai Chi, a member of the Standing Committee of the Political Bureau of the Communist Party of China, visited experts on vacation in Baidehi on the 3rd. The outside world believes that this indicates that the top CCP officials have collectively disappeared to Baidehi for vacation. Wang He, an expert on China issues, said, the entire high-level politics in China is actually very corrupt and very evil. You see, in Western countries, when there's a little bit of trouble, politicians will come to the scene. For example, during the prisoner exchange in the United States, this time, the president came out to greet them. This is democratic politics, and this way it creates a people-friendly image. But the CCP is a dictatorship. No matter how many disasters occur, or whether the people live or die, the officials don't care. Since the beginning of June, floods have affected more than half of China. So far, the authorities have reported at least hundreds of deaths and missing persons. But because the CCP has always covered up the disaster, the actual casualty data is unknown. Ji Lijian, vice chairman and executive director of the China Democratic Party, stated, the number of people is always a sensitive issue. Underreporting means that the disaster is not that serious. So now officials will falsely report and underreport in order to protect their own positions and then cover up more such deaths. Local governments of the Communist Party of China have issued 4.2 trillion yuan in bonds in seven months, nearly half of which are used to repay debts. The local governments of the Communist Party of China, which have long been heavily in debt, are increasingly relying on issuing bonds to alleviate their financial crisis in the face of continuous deficits. In the first seven months of this year, the total amount of bonds issued by local governments nationwide was about 4.2 trillion yuan, about $600 billion, of which about 2 trillion yuan was used to repay old debts. 
In addition, many provinces and cities have issued special special bonds worth hundreds of billions of yuan, specifically for repaying existing debts. Data released by the Ministry of Finance of the Communist Party of China show that in the first seven months of this year, the total amount of bonds issued by local governments in China was about 4.2 trillion yuan, of which the scale of refinancing bonds used to repay old debts was about 2 trillion yuan, and about 60% of the remaining newly issued bonds will be used to invest in infrastructure. The mainland media, First Financial Daily, reported on August 6 that among the 4.2 trillion yuan of government bonds issued by local governments this year, the scale of refinancing bonds issued in the first seven months was about 2 trillion yuan, and the scale of new bonds issued was about 2.2 trillion yuan. Among them, the scale of new special bonds and new general bonds was about 1.8 trillion yuan and 0.4 trillion yuan, respectively. This shows that the newly added special bonds are still the main force in the newly added bonds. Economic experts generally predict that the issuance speed of local bonds will increase significantly from August to October this year, reaching the peak of this year. So, in addition to using new bonds to repay old debts, in which areas will the newly added special bond funds of about 1.8 trillion yuan in the first seven months of this year be invested? Data released by China Enterprise Early Warning show that in the first seven months of this year, the newly added special bond funds were mainly invested in the fields of municipal and industrial park infrastructure, accounting for about 34% of the total scale of special bond. Funds followed by railways, government toll roads, rail transit, and other transportation infrastructure, accounting for about 20%. It is worth noting that since late June this year, Henan, Xinjiang, Shanxi, and other places have successively issued special new special bonds. As of the end of July, the total amount of special new special bonds disclosed for issuance has reached 253.6 billion yuan. Unlike ordinary new special bonds, these special new special bonds do not disclose the one case and two books. That is, project is implementation plan, financial audit report, and legal opinion to the public. The funds raised are not used for project construction, but to repay existing debts. China's delivery industry plunges into chaos. New regulations trigger catastrophic collapse. Recently, the CCP has introduced new rules related to delivery. These regulations include requiring recipients to provide real name identification during pickup, implementing a privacy policy to protect user information, allowing consumers to demand compensation for delayed, lost, damaged, or missing items, encouraging the use of advanced technology like automatic sorting machines, and promoting the use of eco-friendly packaging materials. Additionally, the regulations aim to enhance the management of delivery vans by enforcing speed limits and weight restrictions for electric tricycles used in deliveries. On paper, this seems good, but the consequence is very catastrophic. The Zhongtong Express Qingxiu branch in Nanning has already collapsed. Management is in chaos, and parcels are not being delivered for several days. The branch has relocated, making it impossible to find via navigation. Their phone is switched off. The new regulations have reduced how many parcels delivery workers can handle per day, further lowering their earnings. Merchants may pass higher delivery fees onto consumers through increased prices. In the end, the common people are the ones hurt most by the changes and resulting chaos in the delivery industry. With the implementation of the new express delivery regulations, parcels that were supposed to be promptly delivered are now piling up like mountains, with no one able to handle them in a timely manner. Delivery personnel have stated that the new regulations require them to deliver on time and enhance parcel security checks, but the time allotted is clearly insufficient. They are facing immense work pressure and unreasonable income conditions. Ultimately, they chose to collectively resign in protest of these new regulations, causing a significant impact on the entire industry. Goods are piling up, parcels are stuck, and consumers are voicing their complaints. It notes that fines are often borne by delivery people when packages are damaged or lost. 
Most delivery services don't do doorstep delivery as personnel are paid per package, so they often drop packages at smart lockers or delivery centers to save time instead of doorstep delivery. While this improves efficiency for personnel, it leaves some consumers dissatisfied who must spend extra time collecting packages sometimes with added fees. However, some believe delivery centers are convenient for collecting packages on the way home from work or safer for women who don't want strangers knowing their home address. The resignation of delivery people has also made it difficult for companies to recruit workers after the new year. Goods are now take too long to pack, leading them to pile up like mountains. This looks like an apocalyptic world where civilization collapses. Delivery workers in China are facing increasingly difficult working conditions due to low wages, rising workloads, and fines. Their wages are decreasing while delivery demands and hours are increasing, making the job unbearable. F workers are responsible for delivering packages in assigned areas without help from colleagues and do not take holidays. A government survey found that nearly half of delivery workers work 10 to 12 hours a day, while fines are another major burden. A new wave of resignations has hit the courier industry in China, with one out of every five couriers quitting their jobs. This comes in the wake of new regulations that have significantly impacted the work of delivery personnel. The question remains, are these changes beneficial for couriers, or have their incomes taken another hit? I heard a courier stated, previously, we could deliver around 200 packages a day. With the new regulations, we can barely manage 80 at most. Couriers now face increased pressure as they need to communicate with each buyer, which takes considerable time. This inevitably leads to a decrease in delivery efficiency and, consequently, a reduction in income. On average, couriers earn around 1 yuan per package delivered. With the added cost of using delivery stations, even if a courier manages to deliver 200 packages a day, their income would only amount to around 80 yuan, 11 US dollars and 12 cents. The number of delivery people for takeout these days is just not what it used to be. This isn't just a joke, it's becoming a reality. A few years ago, delivering takeout was relatively easy. Making a monthly income of 20,000 RMB was achievable. Even in the past couple of years, with some effort, hitting a monthly income of over 10,000 yuan, roughly 1,400 US dollars, wasn't a big issue. Looking at the current market, I feel like mere effort isn't enough anymore. It feels like we have to push ourselves to the limit just to maintain what used to be normal. The food delivery industry is becoming increasingly challenging, with declining order prices and longer delivery distances. The average order price has dropped from 5 yuan to 4 yuan, while the delivery distance has increased from 3 to 4 kilometers to 6 to 7 kilometers. Many people have asked me why I haven't been creating short videos or posting content recently. The truth is, sometimes silence doesn't mean there's nothing to say, rather, there are moments when words simply fail to capture the complexity of the situation. However, one positive aspect is that this year's weather hasn't been as cold as in previous years. Aside from having low wage, huge workload, delivery personnel are constantly being disrespectful in China. Delivery riders do not deserve the blame and responsibility unfairly placed on them. Delivery delays are primarily caused by platform and restaurant issues, not the riders. Riders face consequences for these delays despite not being at fault. In the service industry, customers should not constantly trouble delivery riders for minor issues like missing utensils, as the food is prepackaged and sealed by the restaurant. Riders cannot open and check every order. Restaurants sometimes improperly package hot and cold items together against the rider's advice, leading to customer complaints and penalties for the rider. Some locations like train stations and airports are inaccessible without tickets, yet customers insist on delivery and are unwilling to meet the rider outside. Certain residential complexes also restrict access, making deliveries challenging. There is a prejudice against allowing delivery riders to voice these realities. Riders are told to accept the low pay and demanding work or quit. This blaming the victim mentality allows those taking advantage of the system to avoid consequences, while riders bear the burden for these issues. It is unfair to direct platform-related issues and conflicts toward delivery riders and mistreat them over a small delivery fee. Not to mention, 
China has witnessed a significant contradiction within its economic narrative. On one hand, the country boasts a massive middle-income population, reportedly surpassing 400 million individuals, according to the National Bureau of Statistics. On the other hand, prominent TV host Bai Yansong has pointed out a stark reality: despite this ostensible prosperity, the Chinese populace remains reluctant to open their wallets. Which further makes the life of delivery personnel much, much worse. This hesitancy towards spending has sparked heated discussions and critiques, especially in the context of the country's evolving consumer behaviors and the impact on various sectors, especially the delivery industry. The number of people ordering delivery has become less than the number of delivery riders. I have a feeling that after the pandemic restrictions were lifted, consumers have become more reluctant to spend money. Especially now in 2024, I'm not sure of the exact reason, but it seems that every day there is a large influx of new riders entering the delivery industry. It's evident that after the pandemic, various industries are not as prosperous as they appear on the surface. Take our situation here as an example. In the past, few people were willing to join Lapeo, a food delivery platform, and team leaders had to make numerous phone calls to persuade and entice riders to join. However, now, if you want to sign up for Lapeo, it's nearly impossible to get in. In Guangzhou, priority is given to those with connections and familiar with the ropes. Those who don't understand the intricacies of the industry won't last long in Lapeo. Currently, every week there are dozens or even hundreds of riders queuing up to join Lapeo, and in many places, Lapeo has no available shifts and doesn't assign orders. Sometimes, customers just refuse to pay fees. Making delivery much more difficult. This is nonsense. Even you can't pay your own fee, can you? You can't even cover the measly one U.S. dollar and forty cents delivery fee for a single person's takeout order and make me pay it. How much is the delivery fee again? Damn it! I am short by forty cents. For two U.S. dollars and eight cents, what can I even get? A whole chicken costs three U.S. dollars and sixty-one cents, and the delivery fee ranges from two point zero two to two U.S. dollars and twenty-two cents. So you only have about five yuan in your pockets after the measly ten yuan, isn't it? Okay, I'm out now. The core of the issue lies in the definition of China's middle income group, which may be overly inclusive by some standards. For instance, anyone earning a monthly income exceeding three thousand yuan, four hundred and thirty-five U.S. dollars approximately, is classified within this demographic. Given such parameters. It's not surprising that a vast portion of China's 1.4 billion population fits into this category. However, in reality, a monthly salary of 3,000 yuan barely suffices for a modest lifestyle in second-tier cities, covering basic expenses such as rent, utilities, and food, with little to nothing left for savings. This situation is at odds with the traditional Chinese predisposition towards saving for emergencies and future needs. Further discouraging discretionary spending. The reluctance to spend is further exacerbated by the burgeoning consumer debt, which, as of the third quarter of 2023, saw household debt-to-income ratios rise, albeit slightly. The societal pressure of maintaining loan repayments for homes and cars adds another layer of financial stress, deterring any form of high consumption. Evidently, this conservative spending behavior has found reflection on social media. With young people championing low-cost travel hacks and aggressively seeking discounts online, epitomizing the cautious spending habits of what is dubbed the middle class in China, despite the considerable increase in personal deposits in Chinese banks, particularly during the post-pandemic years, the distribution of wealth remains uneven, with a small fraction of high-net-worth individuals holding a significant proportion of these deposits. By Yansong's commentary, hints at a broader economic issue. The need to convert saved wealth into active consumption to stimulate market dynamism, create jobs, and elevate income levels across the board. The delivery sector in China, once thriving during the lockdowns and restrictive phases of the pandemic, has felt the brunt of this spending apprehension. Initially, platforms like Meituan and Misfresh saw exponential growth as consumers, confined to their homes, turned to these services for their daily necessities. However, as life in China inches back to normalcy, these platforms face a major slowdown. 
This downturn is not only due to the easing of pandemic restrictions, but is metaphoric of a larger trend of reduced discretionary spending among Chinese consumers. The anticipation of consumers returning to physical stores and restaurants, coupled with their tightened purse strings, means average order values on these platforms are likely to shrink, affecting their revenue and growth prospects. Furthermore, U.S. companies witnessing this trend are becoming increasingly selective about their investments in China, closely monitoring these shifts in consumer behavior and the broader implications for the Chinese economy. This cautious approach by foreign investors could signal a lack of confidence in the market's ability to rebound to its pre-pandemic consumption levels. As China's delivery industry crumbles under the weight of regulatory chaos and consumer spending hesitancy, the future looks increasingly grim. With delivery workers resigning en masse and orders plummeting, the sector faces a bleak outlook. Foreign investors wary of the market's instability further compound the economic woes. Without swift and decisive action to address these challenges, the downward spiral seems inevitable, casting a shadow over China's economic prospects.